Praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, glad to be gathered together with you tonight on this Wednesday evening. Uh, we will be taking our reading from the book of Acts, chapter 14, and we will read uh, verses 13 through 18. Yes, we read part of this, or we read this uh, in addition to other verses last Wednesday, but uh, we'll do it again today because it was so good. Acts chapter 14, verse 13, Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out, and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love and your mercy to us. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together and hear your word. We ask that you would open our ears to hear our hearts to, to uh, ac accept. But we ask that you have your way in our hearts. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And last Wednesday's lesson, I talked about the events in Lystra. Uh, there was a man whose feet had been crippled since he was in the womb. Paul saw him listening to Paul's preaching and saw that he had faith to be saved. That's, that's a quote. And we mentioned how that indicated knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and not merely hope or trust. Paul, seeing that faith, told him in a loud voice to stand upright on his feet. And this man, with his new knowledge of the person, identity, and plan of God, responded by leaping up and walking. And we know it's talking about the knowledge of God because Paul is clear that he preaches the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified. And uh, so we know that he wasn't talking about um, how to live a purposeful, uh, purpose-filled life or how to uh, trip happily through the daisies. He was talking about who Jesus Christ was. And, and Paul, seeing that faith, tells him to stand up, and he does so. And, and God had not only healed his feet, but also gave him the balance and the motor control to know how to walk as well as to actually be able to. And that was a wonderful healing and we're happy for that guy. And we appreciate the reminder that God is a healer and can do and can make the impossible possible. Uh, upon seeing this, the townspeople thought that Paul was Mercury and Paul was Mercury and Barnabas was Jupiter. I, I don't think I mentioned this, but actually in, in the Greek, but in the scriptures, it's written in Greek, right? And so the names of the Greek mythology were used. Paul was Zeus and Barnabas was Hermes. And, and the King James Version translated them as their Roman counterparts to the Greek mythology. And since the people believed the gods had come to visit, they rushed to offer sacrifices to them. Paul and Barnabas uh, stop them, and Paul tells them that he and Barnabas are there to tell them that the living God wants them to turn away from these vanities and turn unto him. The vanity meaning emptiness and foolishness and things that have not only no power in them, but no, no purpose as well. And, and Paul's audience was, in this case, was not familiar with the scriptures. And so Paul did not try to show them through the, the truth through the scriptures. Instead, he appealed to nature rain, fruitful harvests, food, and, and gladness even as demonstrations of God's revelation. And it is this theme on which I want to speak tonight. When you see the wonders of the world, the beauty and the intricacy of all things, how they interact in such delicate balance, God is revealed. He reveals himself in the glory of the sunrise and in the beauty of the sunset in the peace even of the sunset. He reveals himself in the majestic mountains and the crashing ocean waves. He reveals himself in the delicate beauty of the flower and the terrible strength of the tiger. God is revealed through his creation and the witness it provides. We are part of that creation. And so I pause and I, I want to ask, what kind of witness is your life giving? What does your life 
say to other people about God. Some of us serve as a witness to God's long suffering more than others, uh, but some do even provide witness of God's love and graciousness. We strive to witness of the latter rather than the former. Last week, we mentioned Psalms 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Uh, he continued on, day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. And he also wrote, this is David, I also wrote in the eighth Psalm, verses three and four, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? excuse me, looking at the stars, staring at the moon hanging so perfectly in the sky, lighting the ground with the reflected rays of the sun, and, and seeing the clear, crisp, cold beauty of light reaching across unimaginable distance, one sees the hand of a creator whose touch is beauty. When you see the pictures of earth taken from space and you see this beautiful blue marble hanging in nothingness, following a precise path around this immensity of inferno that we call the sun. It helps us get a glimpse of just how tiny a part of an imagine, unimaginably complicated and vast creation we are. And that helps us get a glimpse, but only a glimpse of the might and the majesty of the one who spoke it into existence. David continues on to say in the eighth Psalm, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Angels are great. They're mighty and shiny and, and do God's direct bidding. Some get to drive fiery angel chariots, although maybe it's tanks or Humvees nowadays. I, I, I don't know for sure. I don't know how, how angelic vehicles keep up with modern technology. Uh, but even as wonderful as angels are, they are nothing compared to the God who created them. He created one that had all the glory of the morning, and yet it was, he was nothing compared to the God who created him. That same God made us just a little lower than the angels, just a little. It's important to say that because otherwise we feel a little bit less than majestic ourselves, but even being made lower than the angels. The Lord deigned, him, deigned to make himself human as we are. He, he, he was willing to make himself even a little lower than the angels. Uh, that's the visiting that, he spoke, that uh, the psalmist spoke of earlier. But even outside all messianic aspects of this psalm, God has given to you and to me a path, uh, uh, an opportunity of glory and honor, not just the glory and honor that we think about in terms of, of conquering uh, the vast armies or, or whatever, and nothing in terms of living a glamorous, triumphant life, but a glory and honor that God has given the opportunity to you and me who aren't even the greatest of his creation to share in his divine nature. We have an opportunity to be partakers of the divine nature, to be sons and daughters of the almighty God, something even his greatest creations do not have access to. How wonderful God's grace is to you and me. In addition to that hugely wonderful opportunity, God has also given us responsibility over the rest of his creation. We aren't the most powerful, the prettiest, or the most impressive of his creations, but he has chosen us to have special relationship with him. And he has chosen us to be caretakers of his creation here on earth. David continued in Psalms 8 to say, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea, our O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Yes, how gracious is our God, how excellent is his name, that he would share himself, his own nature 
with us, uh, that he would put his stewardship of his creation in our hands. Yes, I, I do think that means we need to be careful uh, with how we pollute the earth and how we harvest its resources and how we take care of each other and those we have responsibility over. We, we don't worship creation, but we honor the Lord our God by being careful and responsible with what he has put under our hands. God is a mighty God. He demonstrates his grace and that even though we are made lower than the angels, he still places us uh, in a role of responsibility as caretaker over his creation here on earth. That even in, even though we're not, we're far from the greatest and the shiniest or the glorious, most glorious of his creation, he still deigned to become like you and me so that we could one day be like him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Job tells his frenemies in Job 12, 7. You have to say frenemies because they weren't the best of friends. Uh, they didn't act like friends anyway. And you got to be careful when you read from Job because they, they say great things about God and then they completely misapply it to the situation. Somehow they take something that's wonderful about the Lord and they make it wrong. But uh, Job says in 12, 7 through 10, but ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, and whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind, and the breath of all mankind. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 43, 20, the beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. God's creation provides witness to his existence and to his attributes. If we could speak to the animals, they would tell us about God. Dogs often seem to be an object lesson in love. If we could communicate with the birds and the fish, they would teach us of God and the earth itself would do the same. In fact, if we were to withhold praise, it says the, the rocks themselves would cry out in praise to God. It doesn't the earth demonstrate and it's shaking power beyond uh, to be awesome and beyond our control. When the earth quakes, there's nothing man can do but sit it out and hope for the best. And yet in spite of its immense power, it provides abundantly for us. Uh, harvest or famine after famine, yet it provides enough uh, that we can populate and perhaps even overpopulate this earth. The birds as they sing, the, the fish as they school, even penguins as they endure Arctic winters to take care of the eggs, demonstrate the glory of God. And they honor God as they benefit from his benevolence to us. Uh, my point here is that God gave us creation to serve as a witness about him. That witness reveals enough about him to show humanity that it should turn to him, seek after him, and draw closer to him. Paul writes in the first chapter of his letter to the saints in, in Rome, starting with verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. L listen to this. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Here, Paul is writing that uh, the God's invisible attributes are clearly seen since the very creation of the world. His eternal power and his Godhead, his deity, is made clear and visible to everyone since the creation of the world. These things are, are understood by those things which he created not just hints of an intelligent designer, but even that eternal power in Godhead are made visible and understood by his creation. What this tells us is that you can be all alone, abandoned, raised by wolves. You would still have enough proof that God exists 
to turn to him. He tells us that some turn from his revelation, refusing to glorify him as God and refusing to be grateful for his grace. These are those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The word hold here does not mean to keep in one's hand. It means to suppress or to hold back, to restrain. This is the action in which we see the unbelievers from Antioch and Iconium engaging. They reject the truth and then go out of their way, literally going out of their way, traveling miles to try to suppress uh, the preaching of the truth by killing Paul. It is only the hand of God that kept Paul from death. And in fact, if Paul did die, which some suppose he did, then it was only the hand of God that raised him from the dead to continue on his, his work. These people who ignore the revelation of God, who glorify him not as God, become vain in their imaginations, or their thinking becomes futile and empty, foolish. And the word comes from a root that pertains to idolatry. Their hearts are darkened, and darkened obviously means deprived of light. They are deprived of the light of God, and they lose the joy and the purpose that comes with right relationship with God. The purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That popular catechism, uh, I don't even know how to say that, that popular phrase says, mm -hmm. without God, no purpose fulfills. Even the greatest deeds become emptiness. Without God, nothing you accomplish is going to mean a whole lot to you or to others. There are those, these are those rather, the ones who reject God, who reject his, his witness. Those are the ones who will suffer the wrath of God and suffer the second death, which is being cast into the lake of fire. And I urge you, do not ignore the evidence of God which surrounds you. Do not reject his revelation of himself to you, but rather uh, observe his witness and turn to him. Seek his face and draw closer to him. He is worth getting to know. He is worth serving. This is the heart of Paul's message to those who, would, who were about to worship him as God. God's creation serves as a witness to him and his blessings upon humanity. The cycle of seasons upon which all life depends, rain in its season, a fruitful harvest in its season, uh, all are witnesses of God's great power and his grace. The fact that we are filled with food and filled with gladness or even have the ability for joy at all, all testify towards his great mercy and love towards us. This God who has shown himself in his creation calls us all to turn away from false gods, pointless imaginary beings who have no power, that God who gives us a hint of his glory in the sunset, the God who with every sunrise hints at the hope we have in him, calls us to turn to him, the living God. He is our hope. Mm -hmm. He is our salvation. Yes. And all of his creation points us to him. I encourage you, wherever you are listening, to take out a moment or to take a moment and block out distractions. And if you're driving, maybe you wanna wait till you're not driving. Now, if you're operating heavy equipment or power tools, put those down first, but block out distractions and with your soul, feel out the presence of the Lord. That's the uh, amazing uh, blessing privilege we have is to sense his presence. And if we take that time and we, we focus on him and we feel out with our hearts for the presence of God, you're going to find him. He is calling to you today, and if you will reach out to him with your whole heart, he will be found of you. Yeah. If you've got to that point where you're just living in a mundane routine, if, you're, if your walk with God has lost its luster, if you've fallen away from, that, from your first love, now is the time to reach out back to him and to encounter his presence again and to seek him more closely, to walk more closely with him. He has created all things, and all things tell us that he wants us to know him, mm -hmm. that he wants us to have relationship with him, that he wants us to serve him.
Mm. He's an amazing God. He's a loving God. He's a kind and gracious, long-suffering God. And he demonstrates that to us all through his creation. If you were able to eat today, God has demonstrated his love to you. His, he's demonstrated his existence to you. If you haven't eaten today, then if you're breathing, God has demonstrated his existence today. And give me a message, I'll get you a sandwich. Uh, but God is here. God is present. And he uses all things, including his creation, to point us to draw closer to him. Now is the time to draw to him. He's calling to you to walk closer with him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the wonder and the beauty of your creation. We are thankful for how your creation testifies of you, that you are a loving God of tender mercy, loving kindness, and yet that you have all power, power beyond our comprehension. We thank you for the opportunity to know you and to become your child and to partake of your divine nature. Help us to walk in your ways, to keep your law, and to abide in your love. We thank you for it in your name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.